Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very pleased to welcome you all here for this special occasion on Brewing New Traditions. My name is Ranjana, and I'm the content manager at Gourmet Pro. Uh, Gourmet Pro is a global collective of leading food and drink professionals who can support your end-to-end -end growth initiatives. Our collective comprises 150 local experts across more than 30 countries, and today you'll meet two of them. We've supported some of the leading companies and organizations across the world. Many of you may also be familiar with Market Shake by Gourmet Pro, which um, is a leading innovation and F&B trends newsletter with a readership of over 4,000. We cover market trends, consumer intelligence, competitive landscape, and insider knowledge shared by experts from the food and drink industry. And before we move on to today's topic, I'd just like to announce that we have another fabulous webinar coming up on May 2nd, where another one of our experts will be speaking about the hottest food trends to expect over the next couple of years. Um, you can scan the QR code right here and register for it, or just wait for our email. We'll be sending one soon enough. And now, on to today's session. So, in this webinar, you'll hear about the coffee market and what's driving it today, some of the most exciting emerging markets, yeah. rituals in, in the context of coffee, and yeah. how to develop yeah. products. And the Tankstelle, the Tankstation, which I just showed you. And... Wieso? You can do it, I think, without an account. Machen. I'm so sorry. Could could I request everyone to mute themselves, lassen. please? Sorry. Um, so yes, uh, we will be looking at rituals in the context of coffee and how to develop products and experiences for new sets of consumers. At the end of the presentation, we'll take some questions from you. So please feel free to add any questions in the chat box, and we'll try to answer them all. If for any reason we're not able to get to your question, we'll definitely get you an answer after the event. But um, before we kick things off, let's get to know our experts, Felipe Cabrera and Dr. Rafael O'Connor. Rafael, um, could you kick things off, please, and tell us a bit about yourself and your experience? Yes, thank you. My name is Raphael. I am based in Europe and more specifically in Ireland. And it's a real privilege and honor to be with you today to talk to you about this wonderful um, category, which is coffee. We are going to uh, look at it from a product uh, perspective and ways and means of innovating for this very traditional type of um, occasion. So my experience is very much on the uh, selection of different ingredients, how those can interact with each other, and also from a commercialization and launch perspective, covering pretty much anything from ideation to launch, including life cycle management type of projects. So a real honor and privilege to be here today and introduce you to the wonderful secrets of um, coffee. Thanks, Rafael. Um, Felipe, how about yourself? Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks also for being here. Uh, it's an honor also for me to be here, especially to be uh, here with uh, Rafael. So um, I'm from Colombia. I'm based in China, though, many years, and I've been in the coffee industry also since 2015, here mostly in China. And uh, uh, I'm the founder of a consulting company here in China dedicated to the, the coffee market itself uh, in a very broad uh, spectrum, let's say, from uh, either um, the um, uh, green beans or the raw products to the production, manufacturing also, uh, creation of the new products, including even localization for packaging and so on, and also creation of coffee shop concept or bakeries brick and mortar uh, with my business partner here in China. So we we are like a broad spectrum of all the coffee industry. So um, 
uh, that would be uh, the part that we we usually lack is the part of Raphael. So that's why Raphael is uh, here with us also today. Thank you both. So let's get started. Over to you, Felipe. Oh yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Very well, so let's start the global coffee culture phenomenon. So everyone knows, of course, about coffee is one of the, we can go to a second slide, actually the next slide, which is the second, the coffee is the second most popular drink globally, right? Uh, there's a lot of people drinking coffee and now we have an estimation that 2.25 billion cups are drink daily and that's without the Asian population the huge percentage of Asian population drinking coffee. So it means there is a room for growth, uh, a lot, billions, billions of, of cups of coffee. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so they're also the drivers to grow. What are the drivers that are growing the, the coffee market globally, um, no, uh, not only in Asia, but all around the world? So first that the customers are starting to drink coffee from a younger age. That's, that's we are gonna talk also about today, which is Gen Z and millennials, and actually the, the, the coming one also, which are from 12 to 16, 18 years old, that are starting to enter into, the, into drinking coffee. Uh, then we have also a growing popularity in coffee, especially in new markets, which we will talk also about it, um, we, on emerging markets is coffee is more like a lifestyle uh, and an aspirational products, right? And it's also very trendy and versatile, especially with these social media uh, tech enable um, a coffee brands and so on that really are really trendy at the moment, not only in China, but in uh, all, a lot of places around the world, which we will talk about it also. Next slide, please. Um, then we are gonna see a map of uh, of the world and then you see you're gonna see a circle here on the asia right so um the growth actually not only in in the in the all around the world but asia the growth is gonna be huge because uh a nearly 60 percent of the world's population live there and a lot of that is young people right the median age is 35 years so it means that there is a lot of young people that are really the new target for the for the consumption of coffee. Let's go for the next slide, please. So um, we are, uh, yes. So these are, for example, some of the, of the brands that you can see of this new coffee retail, let's say, uh, around the world. So we can start with China because I'm also based here. So we have Locking Coffee and Coty Coffee. Coty is a revenge coffee brand created by the ousted um, uh, or director of Co uh, Locking Coffee. And then uh, in a similar way, we have also brands like Flash Coffee started in Singapore. Now they filed from background say, last year, but they are very strong still in Malaysia, Indonesia, and another uh, South, uh, Easter, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, we have also in Indonesia, Kopi Kenangan, also is a very new, the, is still a new retail coffee brand. Then we have uh, Blue Tokai, which is the, the example per excellence in India, uh, great, great brand. Uh, we have in Romania, so we are going to go to uh, Eastern Europe, which is again an emerging market for coffee. Uh, is, uh, there's a brand called Five to Go in Romania. Also very interesting what they are doing, uh, adding also a little bit of food or the snacks, very nice packaging to the young generation. Um, and then also we have like in more traditional countries like uh, in the US uh, and in Brazil, for example. So in Brazil, we have the coffee, which uh, in the, the, for the audience that speaks uh, or can read Japanese, the Sa coffee. So it was created almost like a Japanese coffee brand, but it's actually from Brazil by Brazilians. It's just like a, a little bit of like this uh, uh, Japanese style that they added into the brand. Uh, and they are actually expanding also our, around Europe and in other countries, not only in Brazil. And um, 
blank street is in the US also. Uh, uh, also a, a smaller um, a area coffee shops. And this is the trend that we've seen everyone around. It, uh, it's just mostly like grab and go or just sit there. It's not a third space. Uh, that's the difference between the new retail of coffee brands that is just moving this new coffee culture on the emerging markets. Uh, and again, also in the traditional side as in uh, South America and North America. Uh, there's also another brand from India that just opened in Portugal, in Porto, uh, and they are gonna have expansion plans. Since today, Portugal is one of the key um, markets in Europe uh, for this new trend of uh, coffee to the young generations. So this is an example that not only in emerging markets is happening, that it, but also in uh, more orthodox countries, uh, coffee uh, drinker countries like uh, Europe, right? Western Europe. Um, so por Portugal is a very good case study for these new brands, new retail brands that are entering into traditional orthodox uh, coffee drinker uh, countries. Let's go for the next slide, please. Um, then we have, uh, I, uh, before we go also to the coffee rituals, uh, maybe I forgot to mention also about the um, Southeast Asia. Uh, we have also a lot of growth in Vietnam, Indonesia, as I mentioned, India, Thailand, Philippines, uh, because there, there's a lot of young population again. And also because it's very particular that Vietnam, Thailand, uh, and other countries in Southeast Asia, they are growing coffee, um, they are uh, coffee growers, right? Uh, but they usually grow Robusta coffee. And now there is a move to, because climate change uh, and, and other things, uh, there is a move on those countries to make Robusta more palatable. So they are trying new pre processing um, ways to have a, sp a specialty coffee uh, processing from the Arabica into the Robusta, uh, let's say, world of coffee. And that's creating new opportunities for these uh, coffee growers in the Southeast Asia, India, and so on, to really expand their their coffee cultures over there because the people that drink coffee is very bitter uh, they add a lot of sugars and that's the old generation so they are trying also to change all this so that's why i wanted to mention so so this station uh, on here and uh, i also i already mentioned eastern europe and i forgot to mention middle east and north africa so so that's a very very strong uh, emerging market especially so uh, so the um, sorry uh, middle east uh, one example of that uh, is Saudi Arabia. Uh, the public investment fund of Saudi Arabia is investing um, 319 million US dollars to support the growth of the national coffee industry by 2030. So it's very similar to what China started to do it 15 years ago, putting a lot of investment, a lot of uh, uh, power behind the development of the of the culture. So for the people that didn't know, Southeast, uh, um, Saudi Arabia, they do have coffee uh, on the mountain areas, very similar to like Yemen, they have uh, on that kind of uh, particular regions of the mountainous areas. So it's a very small, small production, but the idea is to grow that. That's why the public investment fund of Saudi Arabia, uh, they are putting a lot of uh, uh, capital on it, right? So as you see also in, in North Africa, uh, in Morocco also we have uh, a lot of uh, in my emerging market there. So as you see, it's all around the world that is ha happening this. Huh? So it's not only on for specific regions, it's really all around the world. Um, now coffee rituals, I think the coffee rituals, we can pass it to Rafael. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you very much for giving us an overview of the uh, commercial landscape here. And I must say, it is very enlightening for me because here in Europe, we are probably um, a lot more conservative around coffee. And that's why I wanted to introduce our audience to uh, the opportunities around ritual. And what is a ritual? I think all of us would have a different concept of what that means. So we actually went back through the definition and wanted to share it with you. A ritual is a meaningful scripted set of behaviors that are performed before, during, and after an event. And there is usually a very specific desired result in mind. It's also a repeated sequence of meaningful behavior that occur in a very fixed way over time with little variation. 
And I think it's important when we talk about the coffee category, because from a user experience per perspective, it covers all the different aspects of the end user interaction with the company, with the brand, with the product and the service. So Felipe has highlighted some of the uh, common aspects around the coffee category, but there are also some very clear differences uh, across each of the different markets, across each of the different occasions of drinking coffee. And the power of rituals is that it can infuse meaning into the user experience. So from that perspective, it's very important to appreciate that rituals can induce a much higher emotional responses than typical type of habits that we have around food. And it actually involves fairly complex processes around emotions, around feelings that goes beyond the product. So sometimes there is an even a symbolic meaning and around coffee, there is a very strong kind of social interaction associated uh, with this category. So in terms of um, overall experience um, for the product, it is important to take those into consideration and to enhance the enjoyment of consumption, uh, it's important to uh, put the product into the overall experience uh, for this specific category. So maybe through the next slide, we can also see how different countries have different um, rituals around coffee. So from left to uh, right here, we can see that, for example, people who are going to drink an espresso in Italy would highlight the relaxation, slowing down the connection with other people, Sometimes it even goes beyond that and can be associated with meditation and reflection before the day starts. So when you go to Italy, people are gathering uh, in different parts of the city to have their espresso. In Ethiopia, then, it's a different um, ritual around the brewing, around the roasting and the sharing. And it emphasizes slowing down a concept of hospitality, community, and fostering relationship. And in Japan, if we talk about ritual, it's art, like often, you know, the way Japanese people do it, and it combines precision with performance, highlighting the science, the precision, the attention to detail, and the visual spectacle around um, serving or preparing, serving, drinking, consuming coffee. So those are the different um, areas that you know we wanted to highlight. And maybe on the next slide as well, what we would like to discuss is the fact that um, there are two very different kind of uh, approach around coffee is one is very much um, orthodox and, and focused on rituals and taking the time to prepare the coffee. And on the other side, I think, we are starting to get a feel here that you know the way people engage with this category uh, has changed, and also uh, in different parts of the world, different concepts of the coffee category can bring a completely new perspective uh, to reinvent this category or to satisfy the needs of a different audience, or maybe to drink coffee at a time where usually uh, people wouldn't necessarily have reached out for a coffee um, throughout the day or the evening or the night. So the rituals are changing. And what are the drivers uh, for those changes? The one that we would like to highlight with you are focused around technology. It's also around some of those modern twists to traditional products. A lot of variety and innovation opportunities around flavors and ingredients. Some of the brew brewing techniques as well have been almost reinvented to create new type of product, new type of experiences. And also the functional benefits of coffee have really started to uh, come out. Uh, a lot of science has been built around uh, the benefit of coffee and coffee beans and how some of those can be associated with some very significant um, health benefit, whether it is uh, cardiovascular health, but also mental health. So those are the type of uh, drivers that can really transform um, a category that we would 
have looked at being very traditional, uh, almost outdated, but this is not the case. And I think it's just very important to um, reiterate some of those nuances and common aspects around the coffee category. And with this in mind, I think what we are going to go through here briefly is to um, introduce uh, different segments who are engaging with this category. Felipe touched on this earlier, um, where he spoke about the fact that there are um, new uh, consumers who are strongly engaging with coffee. And maybe on the next slide, if you don't mind, um, Rangina, thank you very much. What we can see here is that usually, um, people would associate the coffee category with the Gen X or our baby boomers. They are the people who are, you know, between 44 to maybe 80 years of age and who have a very orthodox and traditional way of engaging with the coffee category. But what we have seen in the most recent years is that uh, millennials, who are the one between 28 to 43 years of age, are actively transforming this category. And the one that we may uh, be surprised about are the Gen Z. They are the ones who are 12 to 27 years of age and who are also actively engaging with this category. And not even that, we see 10, 11 year old who is our generation alpha and also engaging with this category. So in terms of commercial opportunity, what we want to highlight here is that between the millennials and the Gen Z, we have 52% of the global population. And they are the ones who are really driving innovation, who are reinventing the coffee category. So it's a very different narrative. It's a very different expectation, but it's very important to um, realize that um, this category has been able to adjust to the needs and the lifestyle of a completely new generation. Anything that you would like to add, maybe Felipe, because I'm... Um, talking about, uh, I suppose, uh, a segment that I think you are very familiar when you speak about those new concepts um, that are emerging throughout the world, new brands. Yes, correct. Thanks uh, for, for that, Raphael. So uh, one of those, as I was saying, that these kind of new retail brands and the products that are coming after that is all because of this new, new generation, especially the millennials and Gen Z that they are uh, adding drinking coffee almost not as a beverage itself but as a product and a, a part of the beverage is not a coffee but it's a, a beverage with coffee right uh, that's that's what they are kind of creating and and the changing and be, with that they are adding a lot of non-dairy milks and when you put non-dairy milks like plant-based milks then you can play with more flavors like for example, fruity flavors, even citric flavors, that if you are using dairy milk, that would be very difficult to, to pair together, right? Because it's, it's the, the citrusy is gonna, the acidity is gonna cut the milk, right? So these kind of new things that we, we 15 years ago, we really didn't have it. That's what that, those new lattes, coconut lattes, for example, here in China, super popular, and then they are expanding to, to Asia in general, and then you have different colors uh, and so on. It's very Instagrammable, all that. And all that is also because it's Instagrammable, it's all digitally tech enabled uh, uh, that you can place the order for products or like buy it in e-commerce and so on. So uh, that's, that's the generation really that is pushing the market, uh, like the growth of the market, not the old generation. Thank you for that. Our next slide. So again, here, just to capture some of the points that we touched on already and how our Gen Z and our millennials are so important because they are the most connected generations. Our Gen Z are digital natives. They most never didn't know any time without the internet or without the phone. They are also um, racially and ethnically very diverse populations that can influence taste and culture. And we need to mention their um, interest, their focus on sustainability, which again is a new driver 
uh, that brands need to take into account because this is something that probably um, didn't get as much attention in the past, but could be a real game changer as well for those consumers. Our next slide, please. And back to uh, the point that we touched on earlier as well, what are they drinking? Basically, it can be hot and cold, depending on the time of the day. It can be specialty coffee, but it can also be a cold brew. It can be an indulgent type of experience. They want it rich, they want it heavy, but sometimes they also may want to have a boost and they are looking for something a lot lighter with specific health benefits. And the other aspect to take into account is our Gen Z and our millennials are a lot more uh, focused on convenience and not so much on the uh, preparation that can go around coffee. So those are the key points that we wanted to highlight and uh, that can also um, support the fact that um, there are opportunities to innovate in that space and to pretty much be endless in the different type of comp combination that can be available. Thank you for that. So I think we are going to go a little bit deeper now with our next section um, around the products. So certainly um, what we have already um, seen is that we have our coffee beans, uh, Robusta uh, or Arabica, and they are, play a very important role into um, the preparation of the coffee. Sorry, the next slide, please, Ranjana. Yes, so we have our beans and there is an awful lot of uh, process and step that needs to go into processing those beans. And then from that, we can add uh, multiple different um, ingredients, maybe around the milk or the milk alternative, around flavors, around color, around texture with the foam and with the liquid itself. So by area um, is really around um, identifying the parameters and the attributes of each of the different products and ensure that those are aligned with the consumer's uh, expectation. And this is an example of uh, the type of work that uh, we do, whereby we can identify um, key factors that are um, rated, they are ranked, and then um, we can um, select the specific type of prototypes that are um, suitable for a specific type of audience. So we spoke about how our Gen Z would have a completely different expectation from our boomers, for example. So it's very important that people like me identify those criteria, parameters, and develop the type of products. And not only that we can um, launch um, suitable products, but that there is a harmony in terms of you know, if people go to China, for example, and they want um, a cappuccino, that they can also find a similar type of product if they travel to Europe. So there has to be very harmonized definition and way of mapping the profile of those different products. So this is an example here from a scientific paper. And as you can see here, you know, we can identify whether a product is bitter, whether it is smoky or is it beany. Um, does it have some woody notes? So just an example of how we can map uh, consumer preferences by doing some uh, work around sensory analysis, which is a full science of itself. You know, sensory science is quite a complex area and certainly very relevant to the coffee category. So maybe the next slide, if you don't mind, Ranjana. Again, um, another very important aspect around coffee, because we know that different time of the day, we may have different um, expectations. So what are the parameters that are relevant for each of the usage occasion? And what are the products that are best going to fit the expectations and the requirement for a specific product? So for example, around the preparation, we can see on the left here of the column, the preparation, you know, it differs whether we are looking at coffee in the morning or in the afternoon, or whether it is a social occasion. The smell, you know, sometimes we want it light, sometimes we want it to invade the room. The flavor, 
Are we looking for something very strong or are we looking for something sweet or lighter? And then the froth. So beyond the coffee per se, the whole froth can also be extremely relevant and significant for some of our consumers. So just to give you a little bit of a perspective of the type of work that we do, we have done some of it with Felipe and, and Gourmet Pro to um, identify the parameters that were relevant and make sure that the product that was developed was aligned with the consumer's expectation every time that the consumer would uh, engage with a specific product. Thank you very much for that. Maybe the next slide, if you don't mind. And I think it goes back to uh, the point that we made earlier around the differences between uh, Arabica and Robusta and, you know, being uh, appreciating, I suppose, some of those differences and how different blend, uh, blends of uh, Arabista and Robusta can give completely different experience. And as you mentioned, Felipe, you know, especially around sustainability, different parts of the world, being able to grow a different type of beans and uh, mix them in such a way that we can have more sustainable products. So here we can see, um, you know, the map, the profile of uh, coffee beans from Arabica or Robusta and how some of those nodes have been very clearly defined, you know, especially around coffee where we have uh, about 250 different compounds that are interacting with each other. So we need to really be very um, precise and accurate in how we define um, those different um, ingredients. Uh, I'd love to get your perspective on this, um, Felipe, and how that relates to some of the uh, changes that you have seen around uh, coffee growers. Is it something that uh, is currently being used by the growers with that you interact with? Yes, yes. So uh, on the thanks for support for that too. That that's a very good sideway. So, um, uh, for the audience that are also that are familiar with the wine industry or the wine world, you know, the wine industry, you have like a all like a diagram of all the flavors, uh, the notes that you can have on a uh, wine, right? In the coffee, we in the coffee industry, we kind of copy paste uh, and then adjust it to what is the coffee. So it, we have like a a, a similar diagram, a circular diagram, and that's when the you know we usually have very for particular areas of arabica we have some particular notes for example for african countries we have also high acidity very fruity floral notes then you go back to colombia uh, light body also in in african uh, countries like ethiopia ethiopian coffees then we go to colombia brazil colombia is more mild uh, and then then the sweet and flower medium body Brazil is a slightly stronger body compared to Colombia. Um, but then we go to Southeast Asia, right? Uh, which is Indonesia is like heavy, heavy, full body country, earthy notes, zero acidity, at least in the normal processing. Uh, and that's what I want to kind of for the do a, um, the, the next step of, for, of the topic that we're gonna talk in the next slide, which is sustainability. So without, before going to that, um, the their climate change is really creating more and more uh, difficulties to to have uh, a lot of the arabica producers are some years are having less yield uh, compared to robusta so arabica coffee they really need um, a certain altitude 1100 or 1000 meters above the sea with certain climate con condition it cannot be too hot right while Robusta, it could be below 1,000 uh, 1, meters uh, of altitude, uh, and then it can really stand um, a, a warmer climates. So what is happening going on because of the climate change and all that? Uh, there are a lot of coffee producers, like for example, Colombia uh, or Vietnam, that they are they saying, okay, how can we produce coffees that are similar in the flavor notes to Arabica, without being Arabica, just being Robusta, right? Uh, so they are a, from the specialty coffee world. Uh, there are a lot of different processings, which are um, a natural processing, anaerobic processing that adds a, 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 a carbon a maceration. There are some processes that are copied from the wine industry. And don't, they are playing with these very highly technical processes to process Robusta coffees, 
and those robustas coffees are having a palate uh, uh, taste notes that are almost as uh, Arabica, but they are sell on a cheaper price than an Arabica. We have a Robusta, we have an Arabica, and they are selling right in the middle or slightly higher than the middle. So those uh, new things, because it's just new, this happening uh, one year ago or so, something like that, is really um, uh, empowering uh, coffee farmers and, and, and also uh, coffee producers that are really fighting the climate change. For example, Colombia is also doing that. So it's really sustainability, the climate change is really pushing uh, uh, how we're going to have more yields on coffee. Uh, Robusta, if, it's not, if Arabica is not enough, well, then we need to adapt the Robusta, right? To also to the market for the Arabica. So, uh, and specialty coffees are also a key part on the Arabica. And all that is trying to say, how can we do it to keep uh, this one of the questions that are on, on, the, on the chat was, they were asking about that. How can we keep the pace with the growth on the, on the, on the world? Uh, and this would be one of those steps, is just creating new ways uh, like that. Uh, for example, Japan, I think the south of Japan is also playing with uh, a coffee growing. Uh, and if this kind of robustas new processing is successful, probably con uh, countries like the US can copy it in the south regions of California and other mountainous uh, south regions of the country. So many countries that are not coffee producers might be in the future co coffee producers. So that's, that's something that is really, we are in the, in the, in the industry all struggling to keep up and pace up the, the production and the yields to satisfy the, the growth of the, of the coffee uh, global trend. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, then we are going to talk a little bit more about the new experiences. So we are talking about the products before. We are talking about the generation. What are the generation? What are the target customers, right? The generation C and millennials. And then so what are all these things creating as experience, right? Um, so uh, to explain a little bit uh, to the audience, we, in the coffee world, we talk about the evolution of the coffee into uh, five different uh, waves. It was before four, now we can address a, a fifth one. So uh, the first one was the, the coffee after the Second World War. Uh, uh, the, in the 50s, everyone was drinking instant ground coffee, right, in canisters. Uh, everyone is, is uh, in the old generation were very familiar with that. Uh, then we have the second wave, which is the uh, branded chains like Starbucks. So they introduced to the world really what is having an espresso, an Americano, a latte, because those kind of drinks they were not really global. It was mostly to Italy, and then these brands uh, expanded this all around the world. Uh, then we have the third wave, which is the artisan coffee, which what I usually call like if you see in your coffee shop uh, um, a barista very like uh, with tattoos or the hair very nice, uh, very technical measuring every gram of coffee that he's putting into the coffee filter and then in a special temperature of the water oh, that is almost like a teaser money, right? Uh, that's the third way. Uh, uh, that's, that's the artisan coffee way. But then on the fourth way, we enter into, okay, how can that third way develop into a, an, a more scientific methods, right? A more customization of the roasting, playing with diff different processing methods or roasting methods or even brewing methods, right? So it becomes more and more scientific per se. And also even how we can get more influence from other industries. So for example, in milk industry, there are a lot of things that they've, they've, on the fourth wave, we are gathering, we are getting inspired by that. Also, we are getting that uh, also from, um, I don't know, from the mixology world. So how can we present coffees almost like a cocktail without having alcohol? It could have, but without having alcohol, like a 10 minutes preparation of a coffee that looks amazing in a glass that is almost like a cocktail-like, right? A mixologist approach on a coffee. And then with the fifth one is, okay, how can we convert all this into business, right? Because now we are, the, you know, the, with the climate change, sustainability issues, with the geopolitical situation that is more and more complex now, how can really uh, um, the, this kind of coffee 
uh, um, trains really become into coffee businesses, right? How can the small coffee shops, independent specialty coffee shops, and how can really survive and thrive? How can, instead of being one small store, can really thrive into like a concept, a strong coffee concept, right? So that's what the, the fifth way is, it, right? So we have examples of this uh, 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 here in China. Sorry about being too China focused. I live here. I have taken these photos here. So one of those on the first top slide, you see a cup of coffee called Aloha Coffee. That's a Chinese brand created by a, a Champuchin barista here. And those uh, straws that you see on the top of that thick a, a sour cream a milk foam, you have some straws there that, are, that is saffron. So it's a very unique thing that they are creating for the market, a very particular flavor, like cheesy-like foam with some saffron. And below that is a, 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 a coffee a blend that is very unique, uh, light citrusy. Uh, so it's, it's quite uh, interesting. Uh, then you have below the normal one, which it could be for a, a warm season, like I say, holidays, you know, a, a winters, which is has some cinnamon and all that, which is, that's more like a, um, I would say, a kind of normal presentation, right? And then we have example of what Lock, Locking Coffee is doing in China, which is a, 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 a fully automatic co coffee machine, which is getting trendy uh, instead of semi-automatic fully automatic like that you can serve more customers, you can have more grab and go, you place everything through your cell phone on those uh, on those um, uh, coffee shops. Then also it's very important the freshness on that becomes key, key part also. That's why also is empowering the local coffee producers in those countries that are, are exploring more and more the coffee culture because then if you want freshness, you need to have some reliability of green beans and roasted coffee uh, that is super fresh, one, two, three weeks, one month or so for these uh, the new experiences of the coffee ritual. Uh, and then on the last, uh, on the on the photo on the right, you see a huge coffee shop that has a, a roasters, uh, a coffee roasting machines from uh, Korea. By the way, this brand is, uh, this roasting brand is from Korea in China. The store is in China. So it's really like a, it looks more like a museum for coffee, to be honest. That's the new experience that the, that the new generations are looking for, like a different flavors in the coffee, very Instagram, so social media like, and the inside the environment, it should be also very warm, a very different from what we used to experience in the Orthodox co coffee drinker countries. Uh, let's go for the next slide because I want to do it a little bit faster. So give some people and uh, give more, uh, give people uh, some opportunities to ask questions. Uh, so let's go, please. Uh, we have some uh, products that you, you will see, uh, uh, which are coffee rituals that are developing into products. So liquid espresso coffee shots that are very popular here in China, in Japan, in, in East Asia, in some countries. I'm not sure how popular are outside Asia. Uh, also, it's like a liquid, uh, slowly cold brewing to really create some thin coffees. And also in those thick coffees, you can use it with hot, cold uh, milk or water or whatever you want to mix. And because of that, also, you can play with fruity flavors, as I was putting that on the on the espresso liquid shot. You have a uh, uh, orange uh, cold uh, American. Uh, so that's an example of it. Then also because we are talking about a lot of products that are based on plant-based milks, then you have coconut uh, lattes that are cold, that are served like a re ready to to uh, RTD uh, products, right? Uh, it could be in vending machines and so on. Then also you have on uh, brick and mortar stores, example of this would be a pandam uh, cold uh, coconut latte. So you have latte, espresso shot, espresso shot, a latte a layer, and then in the bottom you have pandam a, a extraction, which is a very Southeast Asian uh, leaf that has a, that kind of green color. It's a little bit sweet. Uh, it's also very good for health benefits. And then on the other one, we have like a, a freeze-dried instant coffee. Then uh, you're probably going to ask, but freeze-dried freeze, freeze -dried coffee, instant coffee is nothing new. Well, this one is new first because it's inspired by a Chinese pharmaceutical industry because in China they use a lot of old ways to create Chinese medicine. So they have ways of 
um, uh, creating liquid and evaporation and, and concentration of those products to create a, 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 a medicine that is pour into water and then you can drink it. It's different from the Western approach that we have the medicine, which is a pill. So the Chinese industry copied that way of processing uh, the ingredients to create really good coffees, specialty coffees that you can really create into instant coffee and you have all the flavors into really one instant uh, freeze-dried uh, pro processed product. And then below that, you see that those capsules that they are using, they are putting into also you know, sustainable uh, packaging, which is cardboard that are cut and then created, uh, put holes, and then just created as a package itself. So they are really, all these new rituals or these new ways of drinking coffee for, by and for the new generations are really creating products that are, are the, the trend lately, right? So this is an example of that. Let's continue, please. Um, sorry, oh, by the way, Ra go... Rafael, if you want to, if anyone wants to jump, uh, Ranjana, Rafael, please let me know. Yeah, um, no, I just wanted to, sorry, Rafael, before, um, um, I just wanted to remind everyone, please, please do add in your questions into the chat. We have just 13 minutes left for the um, session, so we'd like to get to questions. So right, right now is the time. Back to you, Rafael. Yeah. Yeah, just want to highlight how this really um, explains very well how everything seems to be possible, right? And even looking uh, at other industries like the pharma industry to uh, bring some of those new concepts. And, you know, we know that coffee has been associated with health benefit, but the way we prepare and consume can also be and learn from other uh, sectors, right? So thanks for going through that uh, with us. And I think, you know, we can really see here how uh, different ingredients can really disrupt and transform uh, the way coffee looks and tastes and is prepared. So thanks for taking the time to go through that with us. Thanks. Let's go to a slide uh, further. I want to create the next one, please. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to have enough time for questions. So I prefer questions, uh, even though uh, I don't finish all, all, all the slides. This is an example uh, uh, of the environment, the new, the, what are the new retailers creating the environments? That they need? So these new generation are looking for environments like, like this. Uh, this is from a presentation uh, my partner and me did for a uh, for, uh, project. So these are is these are the new environments. These are very bright, warm feeling, woody, bamboo feeling coffee shops that are very clean. As you see, no mess at all. It's almost like kind of clinical uh, tidiness on the coffee shop. As you see, also very easy to navigate for the baristas and the and the people inside the coffee bar, right? Because there are spaces that are usually small, right? So how do you manage and how do you make the most? out of the smaller spaces, right? Again, as I was saying, all the trend is to have smaller, smaller uh, size areas for coffee shops and, and all that into the newer, uh, uh, the, this new re retail coffee experience, right? Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Yeah, I have a little bit delayed. Yeah, so then let's jump into neo-futurism, right? This is the impact of the co coffee rituals. Um, so is uh, I, I think I can pass this to Rafael, actually, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you prepared the landscape very well in terms of, you know, what is the future of coffee rituals and drinking going to look like? So we were trying to come up with something that was going to trigger some thought to trigger some discussion. So we can see how we have uh, new generations engaging with this category. We have new concepts, new stores in which the product is being consumed. And we just wanted to open the floor, so to speak, in terms of what is the future of coffee consumption going to look like? And I think the concept of uh, neo-futurism uh, is a good way of describing how convenience is starting to be uh, very important for us, but so is sustainability. So how are we going to somehow converge into um, a category that's going to address the needs of different target segments? Um, 
take into account some of those very significant changes that we see, whether it is around um, socio-economic uh, shift, but also climate changes. So I think, you know, this is quite inspiring. Um, and I don't know how we are going to do it, but the whole idea of this webinar is to work on this together, right? So Felipe and I have uh, already started a collaboration with Gourmet Pro in order to address the needs and some of the challenges of our customers. But we would also be very interested to hear how some of our entrepreneurs, hopefully they are with us today, would also uh, you know, co-develop or collaborate with us to uh, reinvent or continue to transform and disrupt uh, this interesting category, which again, stayed traditional for a long time, but um, I think for the last 10, 15 years, it's it's a revolution. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Felipe. Am I right in saying that, you know, things have moved faster in the last 10 to 15 yeah. years that they probably moved fi for the 50 years before that? That's how it feels to yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, correct. very curious to hear, you know, about our audience and uh, potentially mm. yeah. uh, discuss those type of opportunities offline. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I agree. I like... think uh, we can start on questions, right? Yes. On the yes. slide? Sorry. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Uh, we do have one question here from Deborah. Um, can the production cover the growth of coffee drinkers? Are the coffee drinkers focusing on quality or quantity? Um, yes. Um, so. so as I was saying, it's a little bit complex. It, it does so. Uh, uh, quality is, uh, as I was saying, is some whenever it's possible is focused on quant in quality. But when we are talking about huge segments of the population drinking coffee, uh, the quality is really difficult. Like for example, specialty coffee is really difficult to produce. Uh, therefore, we are looking more to the quantity side. And after that, so that's why I was saying a lot of coffee producers. We are even trying to get robustas into a uh, arabica filling on on the nodes, so like that we have more production, more yields of coffee in the in the coffee producing area, so like that everyone can enjoy a coffee while we keep growing the the the, the consumption. Um, so it really depends. Um, uh, I guess the the quality would be probably more and more expensive. To be honest, in general, coffee prices are going up. So I would say specialty coffee also is going to keep going up and up. Okay, we have another question here. Um, this talk is very much on drinking coffee. Do you see innovation happening also in the edible coffee space with the new generations? Uh, Rafael, do you want to jump on that one? Uh, if you wish, uh, I think you touched on that earlier where um, you said that um, it's not so much a beverage for um, some of our uh, target segment. It's all it's a product, right? So I think that captures the fact that um, you know edible coffee is definitely um, part of the mix here, uh, whereby you know some people look at that. Um, let's say if if it's consumed to be um, indulgence or if it's consumed to be a product. Um, certainly, you know, that could be another category of edible coffee. And, and you know, coffee mm. is uh, added uh, to multiple food products. So, I mean, the boundaries here are, are not very uh, defined. But in terms mm. of innovation, I think it is very clear from what we've seen earlier uh, around some of those examples that there is absolutely no reason why uh, this couldn't be uh, commercially viable. Mm. But Felipe, have you actually seen any examples in the market? Yes, so one example that I've seen back in Colombia, but then I saw I saw that also here in China, probably in another country is the same then, is that they put uh, chocolate. So you have uh, uh, drops of chocolate and inside you have coffee uh, coffee beans, roasted co coffee beans, of course. So you you have the the a very milky chocolate, sweet, and then when you get into the coffee, when you started to uh, eat it, right, the, the the chocolate, the bitterness, the slight bitterness of the coffee really pairs well with the milk, uh, candy-like uh, chocolate flavor on those ones. So th that's an example of 
editable coffee, yeah, uh, that on dessert side, but editable coffee, right? Um, there's another question, uh, Ranjana. I think about yes. the future. Yes. Um, how do you exactly? How do you see the future of infused coffee? Uh, if I can reply to that, um, let, let me start with this, uh, Rafael. So infused coffee is one, I think uh, uh, it's a, a very popular thing that is going to keep growing. Uh, I've seen also because infused coffee could be, is a product that also you can convert in the, almost like a ready to drink anywhere, right? Uh, if you are in the mountains and so on, uh, uh, you have a space that you are not available or having everything accessible or or like a, it, it's something that is very practical to drink coffee right infused coffee is almost like a like a um uh uh like kind of tea like right ways but for also to drinking coffee we have also something similar with the drip co coffee bags that you can drink it also in, anywhere in airports and so on or when you are in the mountains camping uh uh so uh it's uh i think infused and similar ways of drinking coffee that are practical, uh, they are easy to take, right? And then enjoy it anywhere. These kind of products are the ones that the new generations are probably are gonna be very eager to consume, especially with very nice packaging, right? Uh, sustainable packaging, of course. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I want uh, to echo that as well, and maybe uh, pushing it a little bit further with botanicals extract and herbs and, uh, mm -hmm. how they can bring some wonderful flavor and help benefits as well into the equation. So absolutely. All right. Mm -hmm. The next question is, um, other than Arabica and Robusta, uh, are there any perspectives for ancient varieties that could be rejuvenated? Yes, yes, there is. So we have the coffee tree, right? So Arabica and Robusta are two, let's say, uh, parts of that tree, right? But also we have Liberica coffee, we have Eugenonics, I always forget that, that, that word. There is a special uh, uh, type also. Liberica, as I was saying, is also another part. So that's uh, those are uh, usually other types of uh, coffees that also are, are being uh, by the coffee growers. Uh, uh, they are trying to also reju rejuvenate these kind of cultivars, right? Uh, and then uh, try to also see if there is a way to enter into the market. So I have tried both uh, Liberica and Eugenonics or something like that. I always forget that word. Uh, it's very, very different from the coffee that we drink, especially both are more, the, 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 the coffee cherries are bigger and the flavor is almost like grape juicy-like. It's very particular, it's very different. I think there is a market for that, for sure. But now really it's on the side of the coffee growers and the countries that are on those, like and if they are supporting those coffee growers to play with that, to invest on that, right? Uh, see if some of those kind of varieties also play better with the, the climate change, right? So that's a lot of research and investment that the world really needs to put into that to have these these reju rejuvenating rejuvenations of this kind of uh, old or uh, uh, not traditional uh, coffee beans. Okay, we have one final question. We are going slightly above time, but I think that's okay. Um, that's coffee upcycling. Uh, what do you see in terms of coffee waste being utilized? Do you see commercialization or growth of such products from a sustainability perspective? Uh, uh, Rafael, can I go first on this one, please? Also, all right. So, um, this is something that is really happening as very strong as seen in all around the world, including China, and that is on the coffee packs. Like, after you make an espresso, you have some coffee like the grounds that are suppressed, right? We call call we call that professionally packs, I think, P U C K. Uh, and then a lot of uh, one example of what you can use on that. It's like you uh, use that as a part of a material to create a, a plastic injection or, or polymeters to create things. Like it's not this, but it's like, for example, similar to cup, cups, uh, chairs, uh, 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 tables, uh, uh, forks, etc. So many products that are related also to the food and beverage industry. Uh, that's one way to do it. 
Uh, the other one is also, uh, um, for example, there is an Australian company that they create compostable, uh, uh, they create, they, they, um, they convert trash, uh, like wet trash and uh, food or, or organic trash into compostable that they can sell as a, or organic fertilizer. And I've seen here in China, at least, that they're using this kind of, these companies using coffee cups, uh, 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 pucks, sorry, the, like the, the, the grounds after use to add into the, the mix that is uh, slowly combusting into creating that, that fertilizer because that has a very good content of carbon on it, the, 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 the coffee. So it really helps into this compostable becoming the organic uh, uh, waste touch into fertilizer. So those kinds of ways are doing it. So they put that into a special bags uh, that they are later taken by uh, the, the delivery uh, drivers, like drivers or, or, or delivery uh, um, services into these kind of uh, facilities that could be inside farms, organic farms and so on. And that really produce organic fertilizer that are first is a good way to use those those red residuals on the coffee industry, but also it's a good way to give back, right? The fertilizer can use again in coffee producing areas to fertilize a specialty coffee or organic uh, uh, coffees and so on. So it's really like how I, I've seen many ways to to keep keep doing this. So it's it's very interesting and there is a, a lot of room to invent new things on that. Uh, Rafael, <laughs> I'm good, thank you. I don't think I'll be able to keep up with you. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, can I can I do one last question? Do we have time? Do both of you have time for that? All right. This is from Catherine. Um, I've seen a few companies offering kits to grow your own mushrooms where you need to add coffee grounds as compost and fertilizer. Sorry, that was not a question. That was a comment. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Yes, indeed, it is happening. And then I think uh, Starbucks at some point here in China was playing with the idea to do that. Uh, as as a mar marketing uh, uh, um, promotion uh, for for some of the of the seasonals of, of their coffees, I don't know if at the end they they did it or not, but they were those, those was some of the ideas that they were playing here with the Starbucks China at least. Okay, great. Um, so I guess that's it uh, for now. Right. So. Um, thank you very much both. Um, it looks like that's all we have the time for today. We have gone a little over time anyway. Um, but this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of creating new coffee consumption rituals. And if you'd like to learn more from Rafael um, and Felipe about this topic, do please reach out to us at Gourmet Pro and we can get you connected. Um, there's also a quick reminder that we do have another uh, event coming up in just a couple of weeks and um, we'll be sharing the uh, recording with you it looks like people do want that um, but thank you all for being such a great audience and thank you to Felipe and Rafael for such an insightful session um, have a fantastic rest of the day thank you so much for everyone thank you so much for the audience to Gourmet Pro to Rafael I couldn't have done it also without uh, both of you uh, and really thanks for the audience to also be here otherwise it would be a little bit boring without the audience so thank you so much thanks Felipe thanks Franciela bye-bye all right thank you both thank you all